The broadcast is now starting. All attendees are in listen-only mode. Good morning and welcome to today's webinar, Coaching Skills for Supervisors, Getting Employee Performance and Behavior Improvement One Meeting at a Time. My name is Michelle Wilcox and I will be your moderator today. I will also be monitoring questions you may have during the session. Before we open up the session, let's review a couple of key items. All of the webinar materials we discuss can be found at the URL currently showing on your screen. I will be sharing this URL in a follow-up email, so don't feel like you need to write it down right now. If you have trouble with your internet connection during the webinar, we recommend leaving the presentation and logging back in. We do not, unfortunately, control the audio. Your devices control the audio, so if you have audio difficulties, try adjusting the volume settings on your device. If a telephone line goes dead during the call, hang up and call back again at the same number. If all lines go dead, watch the on-screen chat box for an alternative call-in number. Feel free to ask questions or provide feedback by using the chat box or questions box during the webinar. If you're using a tablet, you may need to tap on the screen for the options bar to appear, and then you can select the appropriate option. We may not respond immediately, but we will work your questions or feedback into the presentation. If we can't get to your comment or question during the session, we will be online afterwards to respond, or we may follow up in an email if we run completely out of time. You may also email us at moderator at aspenrmg.com for up to 48 hours after the webinar if you have further questions. This will be a one hour presentation. Questions and comments are very much encouraged throughout, and the presenter will be answering, answering questions at the end. With that, let's begin with today's webinar, Coaching Skills for Supervisors. Our presenter, or presenter today is Dr. Steve Albrecht. Dr. Albrecht is a trainer, author, and consultant specializing in complex HR issues and security concerns. He holds a doctorate in business administration, an MA in security management, a BS in psychology, and a BA in English. He is board certified in HR, security management, employee coaching, and threat management. He has written 24 books on business services, leadership, security, and criminal justice subjects. Thank you for being with us today, Dr. Albert, and I'm going to turn the presentation over to you now. Great, thanks, Michelle. Looking forward to talking with you all today about coaching skills and some of the things that I have learned in my career about this subject. Thanks to the good folks at Heffernan Insurance for this conversation, and also Steve Thompson and Phaedra over at Aspen Risk Management, who I've known for many decades, good people there as well. So as Michelle suggested, I am board certified in coaching, which means I went through a pretty structured coaching uh, training program where I had to do a lot of it. And at that point in my career, I had done a lot of coaching on what I would call high risk human resources. And maybe some of you have had that conversation as well, where you've had to have difficult conversations with employees, either pre-discipline or as a discipline conversation, or even one of the more challenging ones besides obviously terminations is bringing employees back who have been on suspension. And I have done that many times in my career with employees who have had sexual harassment or racial harassment situations, bullying concerns, things where they were actually suspended, demoted, brought back to the organization in the attempt um, to, to try to rescue and, and help their career. And, and for the most part, in the conversations I've had with them, I would call these post-discipline return to work conversations. Uh, I have been successful with them and they've been successful in their return to the organization because that was the final warning shot fired across the bow, so to speak, that said, if you do not make the changes we want in your performance or behavior, or if you engage in these behaviors, policy violations, again, you'll be fired. And sometimes that's what it takes. I'm gonna talk to you about something which is sort of a last ditch coaching conversation called the PAM or the personal accountability meeting. The hallmark of the PAM, the personal accountability meeting, it is the last coaching conversation, the final one that you have before you switch over to discipline. And coaching has a beginning and a middle and an end. These conversations should be focused on behavioral or performance changes as immediately, uh, especially with policy violation issues or things around service orientation, attitude, engaging with clients, customers, things like that. Uh, coaching can be something that the employee builds up to in a process if it's a skill-based issue or a training issue or there's a gap in their knowledge where we want to get them up to full speed. Um, so I have worked most of my career in 30 years now in workplace violence prevention, and I started in coaching because I was having what would be called high-risk or high-stress, high-threat 
conversations with employees who were threatening to harm themselves or other people in the organization. And that moved me into the coaching cohort, which is not every conversation that I have with employees has to be that stressful and that difficult. It doesn't have to be life-threatening or life-concerning. That's what I started in the early part of my career. But I really transitioned over to how do we get better performance? How do we get happier customers? How do we get happier clients when our employees feel valued, feel appreciated, feel praised, feel supported, feel heard, feel listened to, uh, given opportunities to advance or promote in the organization if they want to, uh, given opportunities to take on new assignments and new tasks when they demonstrate that they're ready for those things. And coaching is what can bring them to that, that higher level in the organization. What I want you to think about is why coaching is so important on a really regular basis for managers and supervisors, not to say that it needs to be formal. You can catch people in the hallway and do corridor coaching, walking down the hallway. You can sit with a cup of coffee. You can go to lunch. You can have a conversation about a specific thing that you heard or saw uh, during a staff meeting that you heard or saw while on, out on the work floor that you want to identify and address right then. I'd say, hey, can we talk for a second? And the, the word that I want you to think about that's most and best associated with coaching is feedback. And, and there's a, you know, a, a, a semantic connotational phrasing that goes with coaching, which is sometimes connected around criticism. You know, there's that phrase constructive criticism, which, which is, feels neither constructive nor, nor helpful. And the idea in, in constructive criticism as well, you know, the employee is supposed to feel empowered and better after this, and typically they do not. Most of us don't like the phrase constructive criticism. So I think it's important to use the semantically more positive phrase, which is feedback. If you look at some of the HR discussions online and in various human resources publications and, and, and uh, magazines and things like that, like SHRM, Society for Human Resource Management, they're talking about not necessarily the phrase feedback, which, which I guess is, is becoming out of favor as, a, as opposed to feed forward. And so feed forward is more positive and feed forward is about here's the direction we want the employee to go as a result of these coaching conversations, which is, which is a direction that's good for both of us and helpful for the organization, helpful for the employee and more empowering. And whether you call it feedback or feed forward is cool with me. I'm, I'm happy with the concept. I think all of coaching should have a positive connotation. It is a one-way conversation sometimes with you and the employee, but ideally it, it ends by being a two-way conversation, which is these are the things as an employee, based on what you have said to me, boss, that I'm going to make changes in my performance or behavior, my work performance, my work behavior, make changes in how I engage with coworkers, bosses, customers, clients, things like that, and that we do it in a way which is not punitive. Coaching is not a punishment conversation. It is not a discipline conversation. It is a pre-discipline conversation. Steve, we'll I don't mean to interrupt, but are you supposed to be moving your slides because you're still stuck on the, the first one? Yep, just still in the intro part. So yeah. I'll, I'll okay. do yeah. All right, thank I'll, you. I'll when we look at, at the business case for coaching employees, it's really around performance, right? What they're doing in terms of policies and procedures and, and deadlines and quality of work, uh, things like that. And it's also behavior. And the behavior piece is, is, is communication skills or sarcasm or the lack thereof, or it is uh, how they engage with people over the phone uh, uh, during meetings, whether they're virtual or face-to-face. And sometimes we see a focus in organizations on the PIP, right, the performance improvement plan, which is about deadlines and quality of work and, and keeping promises and things like that about work, quality work performance, when the focus should be on the BIP, the behavioral improvement plan, which is how do we improve these behaviors? They could be the best salesperson you have, but not great with coworkers. They could be the best IT person that we have in terms of their technical knowledge, but not great with customers or coworkers. So the BIP, the behavioral improvement plan is just as important, if not more so sometimes than the PIP. The reason for the performance improvement is something that oftentimes can be measured much more easily. Are they meeting deadlines? Is the quality of work improving versus behavioral improvement, which is are we seeing a better employee in terms of their interactions with other people? Um, we will talk a little bit about the differences between coaching and mentoring and mentoring, at least from my experience and having done a number of mentoring programs where we've done uh, mentoring training, for the uh, uh, senior staff, we've trickled it down to the managers and supervisors and we've helped them establish 
a cadre of, of people to uh, bring in as mentees, oftentimes that's really around a really critical issue in organizations which sometimes doesn't get a lot of attention until it needs to, and usually at the 11th hour, which is succession planning. So we look at the mentorship program and we look at coaching as a, a one of the supportive tools of mentoring programs is to say, how do we get the best and brightest people into the right positions so that you can retire with comfort? You can leave the organization knowing that, that there are the right people in place. We'll talk about some targeted coaching discussions, which is it may be around training, it may be around career development, it may be around corrective coaching, which is what I tend to do a lot of. Corrective coaching is that discussion that you have with employees where they need to stop doing certain things that are a waste of time and money and not value added, or they need to start doing things which are a better use of their time and skills and performance. And so we'll talk a little bit about targeted coaching in, in four or five key areas. We'll also talk about how you can do coaching over the phone, how you do coaching face-to-face, -face, how you do coaching walking down the hallway, how you can have a conversation over a cup of coffee. Uh, I do a lot of work in public government, and, and I tell the public works supervisors, you know, coach out in the field, at the truck, coach sitting in the parking lot, I have coaching conversations in, in times and spaces which is around the discussion that you want the employee to know fairly quickly, not wait two weeks to have the conversation about something that you heard in a staff meeting that you didn't like the direction of. We'll talk about coaching delivery modes of, over um, um, Zoom. And we'll talk about coaching delivery modes over even text and email, which, you know, I have a 30-year-old daughter, and, and I know she can answer her phone, but she tends not to answer my phone calls, but she answers my text right away. And if you have kids, it's probably similar in your house. And you look and you say, well, how can we possibly coach an employee without eye contact or tone or, or body language? And certainly, especially if you look at Gen Y and Gen Z, and, it, you know, I define Gen Z as that employee population is about about, you know, born in 2000, so 20, 21, 22, 23, a range of employee, where their preference, especially in dealing with, with bosses and supervisors, may be that they're not face-to-face. -face. It may be it's over, over uh, email or it's over text. We'll talk about running coaching meetings in a way where you have a couple of rules to follow. One is that you are doing one issue at a time. Uh, the employee may have, you know, 142 sins, but the one you focus on is the most impactful, the one that hurts the business the most, the one that impacts the business most in a negative way. And one issue per meeting, it's not a beat down. We're not, we're not trying to embarrass or humiliate this person. We're not trying to punish them. It's one conversation about the thing that is most important that, that, that you want them to address. We'll talk about some coaching tools. I'll give you a thing called Keep, Stop, Start, which is one of my favorites. What do we need to keep doing because it's working? stop doing because it's not working and start doing because it's a good idea. And then we'll talk about some archetypes. There are four archetypes of coachees, employees that you may have seen in your career or have now on staff as you look at them that could be the problem child, the plow horse, the rising star or the shining star, and the smart slacker. If we want to foreshadow it, the most difficult employee in that conversation, of course, is the smart slacker because they know how to do their job, but they don't want to. They have the knowledge and skills and ability, the KSAs, right? But they don't have the enthusiasm or motivation anymore. Maybe that's because they feel burnt out. They feel unappreciated, unrecognized. Um, they are topped out in terms of being able not to go higher in promotion. I get this a lot in my, my public sector employees who are at top step. Um, maybe it's because they feel resentful to you uh, because you were promoted to a higher level in the organization over them, or they feel that they were not given the same opportunities that you were. So we'll talk about those as well. So when we look at coaching as a definition, let's kind of break it down a little bit. The first piece about coaching for me is it is a pre-discipline conversation. Those of you that are in union environment that have MOUs and have uh, employee associations, or you may be um, pretty heavy due to union environment in terms of some angst or antagonism between management and, and the workforce, it is not a Weingarten meeting. It is not a, it is not a, you need a representative from the union meeting, it's a coaching meeting. And you can have as many coaching meetings as a supervisor and manager. And this is some things, I, this is the thing I think sometimes new supervisors don't always attach to is you can have as many meetings as necessary until that stops working until the coaching discussion about performance and behavior stops working. And then you say in the PAM, 
the personal accountability meeting. This is the last conversation about this. The next meeting will be this one. You're entitled to a rep. What coaching is not is personal life involvement. It's not fixing this person's personal off the job issues. You may be able to make referral to employee assistance programs or things like that. Uh, if you have a behavioral health component in your medical plan, something like that. But what work is what, what coaching is really should be fo focused on is the personal development for that employee at work, the personal and professional development for them at work. I think sometimes if you are friends with somebody that you are also their boss, that can be challenging and we need good boundaries in coaching. So one of the books I frequently ask people to think about as managers and supervisors is Crucial Conversations. These four consultants uh, from Utah, and there are a lot of uh, really good YouTube videos that they have created, have gone through a number of uh, um, reviews of professional conversations that people have, have been at work, and they have said that 90% of the time we do fine. 90% of the time we have paraphrasing and we give eye contact and feedback. 90% of the time we agree and we address concerns on both parties that there's a, a reasonable conclusion. And what they said is 10% of the times the conversations turn crucial and they define these as having three key elements for one or both parties. And, and once we have these three key elements for one or both parties, it turns into what they define as a crucial conversation. High stakes, strong emotions, different opinions as to what to do. And what they say is anytime you step into a high stakes conversation where the emotions run strong for you or the other person, and there are different options, different opinions as to what to do, it is by default, by definition, a crucial conversation. Lots of good YouTube videos on this. Some of you may um, be this or have uh, people in your organization who are crucial conversations trainers. I've taught versions of this program uh, many times and, and people seem to like the concept a lot. So what these guys have said in the book is, Anytime you step into a crucial conversation, high stakes, strong opinions, uh, uh, strong emotions, different opinions as to what to do, step on the brakes, back up, say or do the right thing, realizing that it is very important to the other person. You may not realize it until the conversation has gone on, but it's certainly turned into something which is a crucial conversation. And I like the concept a lot. So we look at coaching as a a couple of things I've already talked about. One is performance improvement, the other is behavior improvement. That's our interactions with people, managers, supervisors, coworkers, other departments, other department heads, taxpayers, visitors, vendors, clients, customers that we're engaging with as part of their work. And then that third one, a negotiated agreement between employees. How do, and that's a, that's a, a, a long way to say conflict resolution. How do we get two employees to agree when they can't stand each other? And you may have that situation where they can barely tolerate being in the same room. And I'll talk about a model for what we do for that. And then we use coaching to get the team where we want them to be. Maybe we have some people on the team that are not as fast or efficient in certain parts of the project as others. We, get, we coach them up. We get them where we want to be. Uh, we use team success and team coaching to give praise and to validate the, the results and successes of the group. And the last one, which is probably the most complex version of coaching that I have done, is where we have groups and departments not getting along with each other or groups and departments not getting along with other departments. There are natural, if you've worked in organizations at all, there are natural enemies between departments, especially if you have a compliance type department, especially there's, there's oftentimes conflict between groups that have, you know, sales and marketing don't see the, the world the same way. Finance department and, and operations don't oftentimes see the world the same way. So team conflict resolution is another thing we'll talk about as well. So when you look at coaching, the phrases around mentorship and being a mentee or a protege or a coachee um, um, can certainly spring to mind. And the concepts as I see them are, are fairly close. If I had sort of a, a defining um, um, separation for mentorship versus coaching or mentor the mentor process versus coaching, it's really about the future. Uh, coaching oftentimes can be uh, something that we want to address for today, performance, behavior, um, some of the rules of policy and procedure and attendance and things like that, as opposed to mentorship is who's going to take over this organization, this department, this team, who's going to become a lead, a supervisor, a manager at some point in time. Uh, those of you that see it at the executive level, who's taking over at department heads and, and moving into the C-suite level as well. That's what mentorship is all about. And so we use the concept of, of a mentor, somebody that is a wise and trusted counsel and role model, 
that could be you. It, it could be somebody that has done that for you as part of your career, your career success. I think about when I worked for the city of San Diego for, for 16 years, I had a really uh, a powerful mentor who not only didn't care about what other people in the leadership thought about his methods, which made him kind of a maverick, but also just a very intuitive guy that taught me a lot of sort of the gray areas of, of business life. Uh, mentoring, guided support, and teaching, leading others to their own successes. That's a really interesting phrase for mentoring and coaching as well, which is not just always telling people what to do, but using your skill of influence to, to see the wisdom of what you want them to do and why it matters to them. The process for an experienced, highly regarded, and empathetic person, empathic person, the mentor, guides another individual, the protege, the mentee, or the coachee, in the development and reexamination of his or her own ideas, learning, and personal and professional growth. Now, think about that phrase and say, well, some of my employees don't want to promote. Can I still mentor them? Yes. Can I still coach them? Yes. Sometimes they don't want to promote for whatever reason. They're happy where they are. And you say, that's fine. I can get the best out of them in the space where they want to be. And for those employees who do want to move ahead in the organization, I can help them on a career path. Last one, a legacy building tool for succession planning says, how do I turn this department, this team, this part of the organization over to other people that have the skills that I want them to have? And how do I take the time in maybe several years to get them the technical knowledge, the, the customer base, um, the things that they need to have to move forward in the organization just the way that I did before I leave? So let's talk about some things that can kind of get us stuck in terms of caveats. One is that it is easy sometimes when we get frustrated with employees, either performance or behavior, to focus on labels. You're lazy, you have a lousy attitude, you're always late, those are labels. What we need to focus on is behaviors. When you come in 15 minutes late, it interrupts how we're trying to do things. When you are sarcastic to customers over the telephone, it hurts what we're trying to do in terms of our brand. Right. So I always start with the concept of get yourself out of label based thinking and into behavior based thinking, because not only is it useful for the coaching conversation, but it's really important for things like performance evaluations and, and writing coaching plans and, and recapping coaching conversations, not to label people. Second, it's easy in working with human beings to find them in a conversation where they find the path of least resistance, which is they will make excuses. You know, dog ate my homework, there was traffic, the baby was sick, and the reason I was late was this, this, and this. And it is easy sometimes to get into a conversational sort of tennis match, a pickleball match, a ping pong match, we use whatever phrase you want, where you go, yes, you did, no, you didn't, yes, you did, no, you didn't, where they, no, I didn't, the other person keeps kind of kicking the ball, uh, the, the paddle ball, the pickleball, the tennis ball, back to your court to say this, this, this doesn't apply to me. And so this is where the be behavior piece is really important because you can define specific examples where you saw the behavior or the performance issue that you don't want them to have. Instead of making sweeping generalizations, well, you're always this or you're never that. If, with excuses and rationalizations, I do the same thing every time, which is I acknowledge it, I put a fence around it, I move on to what I want to say. Yep, I hear you about the traffic, that is tough. Let's talk about some solutions. Yep, I, I realize that you're having some issues in, in you know, the health of your kids and and, we want to talk about appropriate use of sick leave. Let's look at some solutions. Not that you're denying the issue or that you're denying their, their, the impact of the issue on their lives. It's significant for them, especially off the job stuff, but that you don't get caught up in that tennis match. Third thing for coaching is confidentiality, which is unless you're a priest or a lawyer or, or you have a um, um, psychology degree where you're a psychologist or psychiatrist where you have a, a confidential conversation with somebody not to leave that room, uh, most of us have the kind of confidential conversations, which I would call careful confidentiality, which means if you tell me you're not getting along with a coworker, I'm not going to run and tell that person that you're not getting along with them. But if you tell me you're stealing from the organization or you're engaging in other unethical or illegal behavior, I'm going to report it. And I say that all the time in coaching, especially as an outside guy coming in. I will say, we can talk about anything and I will be confidential to you uh, as long as it doesn't violate policy or break the law, in which case I'm going to report, report to HR or whoever brought me into the organization. For you, especially from an internal perspective, you can create situations where people don't trust you to talk about things that are going on if they feel like you're going to go back and speak to another employee about it. You know, Mary said or Joe said or, or Susie said X, Y, and Z about you, then you're, you've lost your credibility and trust. What you can say is, look, 
I will keep confidential. And if I create a recap of this report for or this conversation for my own files, I will address the themes that we talked about, not specific word for word discussions. Why this is important is it may be very useful for you, and this is based on your management style, to keep a coaching file on every employee that you have. And the coaching file, and this is important, is not a secondary personnel file, but it is a collection of the conversations, your notes and documentation, that the employee could look at if they want to. It's not confidential and is not a secondary personnel file that helps you say during the span of the rating period, let's say you evaluate employees once a year, here's what we talked about. Here are the themes. Here are the issues that we talked about. Here's what the employee said as they were going to do to make these changes in performance or behavior. And we'll talk about the importance of coaching files. The last part is that coaching is a way to provide praise and support and recognition and rewards for good work to people as they go through their work time with you. It, you we catch them in the coaching conversation doing the right thing. It's not always negative. It's supportive and it is a course correction. It is sometimes a slight adjustment that you want to make, have them make in certain areas. So. Again, we talked about this. Maybe younger employees by text or by email would be their preference. If you have remote employees, you can certainly coach by phone or by Zoom. If you um, um, want to raise the importance and the stakes of the coaching conversation, you can have it in your office where they're sitting you know, in front of your desk. If you want to lower the emotional temperature, you choose a neutral location, a conference room, something like that, or you walk down the hall and catch them in the things that you want to talk about. And I say this all the time, good bosses coach every day not on every single nitpick, you know, pick on them, uh, micromanage issue, but on those things where you say, I, I really appreciate the way you do this. Have you thought about doing this in, as an alternative in sort of course adjustments? And then you use the bigger coaching conversations for those significant issues that in, in hurt the business in a negative way. And that's not all the time. That's a once in a while thing where it's, it's pretty significant, but you can always have a performance or behavior conversation every single day for things that you want the employee to do slightly different or dramatically different. So here is a collection of the things we usually coach about, what I would call the big seven. Work performance, that's quality of work, that's getting things in on deadline, et cetera. Violations of policy and procedure, you cannot smoke in the dynamite factory, right? Attendance, managing of their breaks and lunches and sick leave, things like that. Their attitude with each other, with coworkers, bosses, with other departments, other team members, with clients, customers, et cetera. Conflicts they may have with clients, customers, taxpayers, conflicts with other employees, with bosses, with you. Um, teamwork failures, where they're not working to team capacity, they're missing deadlines, internal deadlines, they're not getting things done that help their overall team success. Service orientations, and think about this, we have two service orientations in the organization. We serve each other, certainly, and we serve the external customer people that, that pay the pay the bills, right? And sometimes we can be really good at taking care of our customers, but not good at taking care of each other. Sometimes we can be really good at taking care of coworkers, but, but not be dismissive of customers. And in worst case scenario, we don't take care of either the customers or each other. And then the tough part about coaching, especially if you look at, you know, return on the coaching investment, you know, the ROCI, right? The turn on, the, on coaching investment is how do we demonstrate success? Because some things that we see in coaching are subtle. Some things we see in coaching take time. Some things we see in coaching are dramatic differences, right? Start, start showing up at you know 7.59, ready to go to work at eight, as opposed to coming in at 8.15 every day. That's, that's an obvious measurable improvement. But sometimes just their compliance in policy may be easy to see, and, but other times there are changes in their attitude or interactions with, with coworkers or bosses or clients. They're taking on more responsibility and they're being accountable for their actions. They're keeping their promises. That stuff is not so easy to measure and you may see it over a span of time. I oftentimes talk about the business impact. This is the need for coaching. This, that what the, we see the employee doing is hurting the business. And this sometimes goes back to what we see as we walk around. That's the MBWA, management by wandering around, uh, what we see on the spot. Um, the, the conversations we have about the big seven, which I just addressed, service, conflict, um, um, policy and procedure, things like that. The third piece is interesting to me. I oftentimes do a lot of coaching for employees who have a skill gap, which has not been noticed after several years. They will have some kind of training issue that they have managed to get by without having to know how to use the software. 
they will have some sort of training issue which they get other people to do their work. And that sometimes comes out when they are confronted, especially in performance evaluation. And we will say, wow, you know, that we thought you knew how to do this and you don't. Okay, let's get you up to full speed. Let's get you up to full capacity on this particular piece of equipment, software, whatever it happens to be. Fourth one, career planning, um, promotional opportunities. For those that want to do it, not everyone does, but for those who do, the mentoring possibility, especially for succession planning. Um, that, that piece about off-the-job issues, I'm a big fan of employee assistance program. I've used EAP uh, all the time in my especially high-threat uh, um, workplace violence prevention uh, discussions. Uh, EAP, I think, is valuable if you have that resource, employee assistance program in your organization. Certainly, as a way to get two employees to get along, we'll talk about it, and another way for the employees to get along in groups, we'll talk about those as well. And then the last one is really significant, which is how do we use coaching to recognize skill, recognize ability, recognize uh, quality work, recognize higher performance, recognize going the extra mile as a way to not only reward employees, catching them doing the right things, but also saying that this is good for the entity and the organization. It helps with the overall morale. So one of the issues I want you to think about is a is an alignment, perhaps, where you perhaps are the best person to talk to this particular strata that you see or not. I get this a lot where, where sometimes we have older supervisors and younger employees or younger supervisors and older employees where there's a disconnect. And I'm not saying you cannot talk to people that are not your own age, but think about this in your own life. Most of us hang out with people plus or minus five years of your own age, right? I typically hang out with people that are a little bit older or a little bit younger than me. You probably do the same, right? The music you liked in high school, you probably still like today. Um, I'm embarrassed to admit that I liked disco back in the 70s when I went to high school, but, you know, it is what it is. When you look at these strata here, we tend to have the best connection with people that who see the ocean through the same little drinking straw that we do. We have a uh, an alignment, which oftentimes comes around age, where you say this person sees the world the way I do in terms of cultural references and pop references and, and sort of work history and things like that. It doesn't mean you can't coach people that are outside of these these strata, Generation Z um, can be coached by baby boomers. I do it all the time. But you must sometimes look at some of the possibilities where there is conflict or misunderstanding because we're talking about completely different generational views about things. So I often say in organizations, if there is team conflict and it is not of a sexual or racially harassing nature or it's not of a bullying type of a thing, oftentimes the team conflict comes because these strata don't get along with each other outside of, of um, you know, there'll, there'll be um, passing conversations about things, but they won't trust each other or like each other very much because they just don't see the world the same way. So look at where you may have conflict issues and say, is it, if it's not based on sexual or racial harassment, is it based on age as a possible divider or, or a driving point that makes it difficult for these employees to get along? So one of the issues that we have with coaching is you're expected to pick it up on the job. You're expected to know how to do it as you come into your supervisory role. Now, I, I don't recall getting much of it in college. Uh, I got a lot of it in grad school practice, and I went through a coaching cohort with, with a field and graduate university, so I did a lot of coaching. But most of mine, probably like you, was based on on-the-job experience once you became a supervisor. Having discipline conversations, having HR-related conversations, having performance or behavior conversations. So as supervisors, sometimes we fear conflict, we fear con confrontations, especially about poor performance or poor attitude. We've not been formally trained. We don't know of access to any resources. Perhaps human resources is a support entity for us or not. And then the bottom two are really significant for me, which is that you don't get much help from your boss who may say things like, why can't you manage this one person as well as you manage the other nine? Instead of saying, let's talk about what we need to do for that one person. So I can help you manage him or her as successfully as you do the other nine. And the last one is an inverse reward system says we don't get much help or support from our boss or HR until something bad happens. When you think about these possibilities, it can make us not want to coach, meaning I'll just let stuff go until it gets really bad, which is not the appropriate way. It doesn't mean you have to micromanage, but you have to pay attention to those things where you can make small to medium to large adjustments in the employee's performance or behavior through the coaching conversation process before we wait till something dramatic or significant or expensive or embarrassing happens. So a couple things about the value of coaching. We talk about 
answering the WIIFM question for employees, which is what's in it for me? What does coaching mean for me? Why do I want to be involved in this? I have to do it as part of my work. I get it, but why? And for us, it, it says, I can tell you as your boss where you stand with me. I can tell you as a, my boss wh wh where you stand with this department or team. I can tell you what specifically, not just be better, but, but improve on these areas. It helps you help them set personal, professional, and educational goals. Where do you want to be in your career? What certifications, education, um, um, college uh, uh, programs, things like that, uh, do you want to help grow your career? It helps them promote if they want to do that or move into other positions if they want to do that. And of course, not every employee does, but for those who, who do it, coaching can give them a, a recognizable path. It solves conflicts between two employees, which we'll talk about. It solves conflicts between groups, which we'll talk about. And again, as a reward for what they do. So that's the why do we coach on behalf of the, org the employee. So here's something that's kind of painful sometimes to think about. You may have a lot of expectations about an employee and you can leak those out positively or negatively. If you say, boy, this person's terrific and she's gonna do really well, you tend to manage to that expectation. If you say, this guy's not so, not so bright and may not do very well, you may manage to that expectation as well. So our expectations can sometimes self-fulfill. It's important not to do that. And, and as hard as it is, it's important to say, I will be neutral, I will be unbiased, I will have hope, I will be optimistic about what I can do for this person in terms of performance or behavior and what I expect them to do with praise, with, with support, with steps. And then the last one is probably the most challenging thing of all, which is, speaking of challenging, you may have to spend time with the employees who make you crazy. You may have to spend time with employees who already are, are on your last nerve. Um, those are the ones that need coaching. Your shining stars, your rising stars don't necessarily need that, and that's, that, that's the challenge. You may have to spend more time with people who frustrate you. That's what coaching is all about. So you can look at performance evaluations, especially if you take on a new group of people, especially if you're a brand new supervisor. When I did that with the city of San Diego, I got 15, 16 people with a, the clean slate. I used the evals, the best evals, not as a perfect predictor, but as a guidepost for what the previous supervisor may have seen that I may see as well or not. So it's a check for me. I can talk with my peer, peer supervisors. I can talk with my bosses or other managers about the employees in terms of their performance or behavior, positives and negatives. Um, I can put out that, that I'm available for coaching through an actual open door policy, physically or digitally, right? That, that we have staff meeting conversations where I encourage people to know that I will come and talk to them about coaching issues. Uh, that fourth point, I'm going to come out and catch employees before they put their career at risk. I'm going to come out and find employees before they put their probation status at risk. I'm going to come out and find employees who are struggling and are embarrassed or ashamed to admit that they don't know how to do something, and it may be a training issue, which I can address. And then the last one, certainly positively, I'm going to keep my eyes peeled for those employees that I think are good candidates for promotion, good candidates for career development in the organization. So we talked about a couple of these, one, one meeting per, or one, I'm sorry, one uh, issue per meeting, not 100 things, a goal for each meeting, respect for the time, we show up on time, we finish on time, uh, no physical or electronic interruptions. It's really um, demeaning to the employee if you look at your phone while they're talking to you. Um, confidentiality, which again is, is, as we discussed, not you know, blanket confidentiality, but I will not share personal conflicts you're having with somebody else, but I will, I will report ethical or, or illegal behaviors. Homework is a big issue for me and a big, a big part of my coaching toolkit. And notice how homework is in quotes. By homework, what I mean is that the employee does it at work. It's not homework, it's homework, right? They're doing it at work. It's a policy I want them to read. It's a, an article I want them to read and discuss next time. It's a, a self-assessment quiz to take online. It's a YouTube video I want them to look at. Um, we use homework to demonstrate the importance of the conversation. Speaking of demonstrating, one of the things that we prove coaching success is how do you get the employee to demonstrate what you have just told him or her to do? <coughs> Excuse me, maybe one of the issues is that the employee is afraid to speak in front of groups or present, and you say, okay, let's practice, and then I want to turn you loose, and let's demonstrate that you know how to do the things we've just talked about in terms of a successful group presentation. So demonstrated use of tools is demonstrate that you know how to use the software for me. Demonstrate that you can drive the forklift. Demonstrate that you can do the things we've talked about. And then the last one is if you need another session, sometimes coaching is one and done. 
that you talk about what that will be. When we get back together again, here's what I'd like to focus on. I'd like you to look at this policy and let's discuss it, something like that. So here's the targeted coaching I talked about. Most of the work that I do is corrective. It's career rescue, there's some sort of skill deficit, there's some kind of compliance issue where the employee is struggling. It's either their attitude or their, their, their job knowledge, but they're at, at risk of losing their jobs. I spend a lot of time in this area, especially around harassment issues. Um, I just did a, a, a sexual harassment expert witness case in Denver last week um, where I tested on, testified on behalf of two uh, female plaintiffs. Um, performance improvement is how do we improve their job skills and their job knowledge so that they can be better at what they do. Career development, how do we improve their personal and educational skill set and, and, and toolkit so that they can promote if they want to. Executive and strategic may be for the direction of the organization, the senior leaders, that could be some mentorship for some of you. And then the last one, I do sometimes what I call special problems, which is oftentimes this person has a significant off the job issue and I will help them with access to resources or employee assistance program for some of the off the job issues that they have. So think about where your sweet spot might be for coaching and say, is it is it corrective? Is it performance improvement? Are you helping people promote? What, what's where you tend to be? And this is sort of a bell curve. I'm kind of in the middle, a career development, performance, and corrective most of the time. I do a little bit of executive strategy retreats, uh, and I do some special problems for especially for workplace violence prevention, but I'm kind of in that middle, middle section. See, think about where you are as you look at this list of five. So let's talk about the PAM. The PAM is the last coaching meeting before you switch to discipline. The PAM is not a threat. The PAM is not a or, or else kind of a conversation. It says, look, we've talked about changes in your performance or behavior. If it doesn't happen, the next conversation we have is, is discipline. If you're entitled to a union rep, you can have one at that meeting. This is a cards on the table, final conversation that says, look, I'm frustrated a little bit or a lot. Um, we've talked about these things and I've seen either no change or the change is not stuck. I've seen the kind of change where you are episodically doing the things we've talked about, performance or behavior, but it, it doesn't stick. This can be probably the most useful part for the smart slacker employee who is knows how to do their job but doesn't want to. They're angry at you, they're angry at the organization, they wish they were promoted, they wish they could retire but they don't have enough years in, things like that. This is where you say, look, I know you know how to do these things. I'm counting on your experience. You're a legacy employee. You've been here long enough to do the things we've talked about. I don't know why you're not. So my next step is to, is to switch over to discipline. And the reason you and I have that conversation with ourselves is without consequences, we don't get change. It's not punishment. It's just that sometimes we need consequences to enforce policy, to get people to be different. And it's not an argument, the PAM. It's just a, a, a statement of fact, which is, we have met on this issue four times or six times or 46 times. I'm not seeing the changes I'm looking for in terms of performance or behavior. That's why it's the PAM. The next one is going to be discipline related. And you can't use the PAM as a, here's what we're gonna do for discipline and then not do it for the next conversation. The, the way the PAM works is it is the last coaching conversation. If you do not see changes in performance or behavior that you have been talking about for all these other meetings beforehand, you must, use discipline next time. If you threaten the PAM and don't use discipline, they don't, they don't believe you. It's not useful. Don't do that. When we look at the PAM, it is the last conversation for the employee in terms of performance or behavior before they realize the seriousness of the situation will be a next conversation will be discipline if they don't make the changes. And I want to talk to you as we wrap up a little bit about a conversation ender, which is by my colleague, Glenn Kramer. Uh, Kramer is a, a well-known labor law attorney in, in Los Angeles. He only works for uh, organizations. He doesn't sue you know, companies, he defends them. And what Kramer talks about, and this is the PAM is a perfect place to use this, but also at the end of every coaching meeting, he has this conversation where he says, are there any reasons? that you cannot do the things we've talked about? It is a yes, no question. Are there any obstacles or anything I need to know about as your boss that will make it difficult for you to make these changes in, in performance or behavior that we discussed? And you document their answer. And we'll talk about a coaching file in just a second. So these steps kind of vary and there's a kind of an overarching outside theme for some of these things, which is excuses and rationalizations, which we talked about. Put a fence about, around it, agree to it, put a fence around it, get back to the conversation. 
I hear what you're saying about you know not getting help from Janie in the in the finance department. Let's talk about the, what the potential solutions are. You don't necessarily buy into the to, to the excuses or rationalizations. You just acknowledge them and, and continue to search for solutions that the employee creates, not just you always telling him or her what to do. So you look at this process here, planning for the meeting, opening the meeting, describing problem areas, not again with labels, but with behaviors, right? Specifically when you are late with your Friday report, this is what happens. Ask the employee for solutions. Ask for their solutions so much so that there's a little bit better buy-in because it came from them, not you just telling them. Fine tune the solutions, come up with better alternatives. Wrap up the meeting by, by appreciating what the employee does in a positive way. Talk about how they're going to put what you've agreed to in, in play and then wrap up the meeting and wrap up the meeting with a closure email or a closure memo that is part of, of the record keeping for this, which is also part of the coaching file. Let's talk about the coaching file. The coaching file is a collection of your conversations with the employee during the rating period. It's not a secondary personnel file. It simply exists to say, here's the stuff we talked about. So when I do a performance evaluation at the end of the year, if you do it once a year instead of my favorite, which would be quarterly, that you know what you've talked about and the employee either has done those things or they have not. My favorite coaching tool in terms of, of, of small group coaching or individual employee coaching or even myself when I sit down with an adult beverage every, every December 31st is keep, stop, start. What do I need to keep doing because it's working? What should I stop doing because it's not working? What should I start doing? And we ask this of the employees, what do you think employee that you need to keep doing? Or what, what, let's talk about what I want you to keep doing because it's working. Or what I want you to stop doing, what you think you should stop doing because it's a waste of time, money and effort. And what should you start doing or what suggestions do you have for me about things that I can agree upon that you can start doing? Keep, stop, start is an old time organizational development tool and it works. You can aim it at yourself. You can aim it at the group, small groups or your staff. You can aim it at individual employees in the coaching discussion. So there are some things that we can use as sort of open-ended questions. What's working for you? What's not working? What are your biggest challenges? Or who are your biggest challenges? Look at that third one, SDB, self-defeating behaviors. Uh, what self-defeating behaviors can you identify? This is lateness. This is sarcasm. This is rudeness during staff meetings. This is idea killing. This is missing deadlines. This is quality of work. Those are self-defeating behaviors, meaning the person can control these things. Um, with whom do you have a positive relationship here at work? Who do you have a negative relationship? Let's talk about that. Uh, what do you want to do differently in your department? Or what do you want other people to do differently around you that I can help facilitate or use my leverage as a boss? I also want to talk to you um, uh, about conflict resolution as well. When we look at the coaching candidates that we have, this, this two-scale model here is the employee's possible or potential contribution versus their actual. The plow horse is, is not a bad person in terms of, of you know, sarcasm or rudeness, but their potential is low because they get stuck on the plow. You give them an assignment, they get stuck. They don't know how to go forward on it. They're not, they're not creative thinkers because sometimes they were not told to be creative thinkers by their previous bosses. So their potential is high. In, in, I mean, their potential is low. Their contribution is high. They get a lot of things done, but they don't, they don't do it all the way through. Their potential could be a lot higher if they were more creative, if they were more problem-solving oriented. Problem child, low actual contribution, low potential contribution. Sometimes those people don't usually make it past the probation period. Rising star, high contribution, and their potential is unlimited. They could be promoted. They could go to the next level. There are sometimes in your mentorship um, um, thought process. The problem with the rising star is two things. One, you can burn them out by too many assignments, too many tasks, that you put them in charge all the time when you're gone. The second is that you can um, turn them into teacher's pet, which creates resentment in the other employees. The most challenging up there, of course, is a smart slacker. They know how to do the job. They don't want to. They have retired on duty. Um, they figured out not only how to slack themselves, but they, the worst part is they teach other people how to do it, and they create other smart slackers. Let's talk about it. Smart slackers got to confront their behavior, performance, or their attitude. Ask for their help and say, I know you know how to do these things. I, you know, It seems to me you're burnt out. It seems to me you're unmotivated. It seems to me you're angry. And, and, and this is a hard conversation to have, but sometimes you have to have it to say, what needs to be done differently that I can do, or what expectations do I have from you? And they're also a candidate for the PAM. Uh, problem child, use your uh, progressive discipline processes, use your probation processes. Sometimes we make the, ask them to make a stay or go choice. If they're not happy there, you say, you know, do you want to stay? 
in which case I'm asking you to be doing these certain changes in your performance or behavior, or are you thinking about leaving? And sometimes they go. Uh, Pile horse, again, reward their progress, reward them when they option think, reward them when they problem solve. Sometimes they were told not to be creative and they took that literally. And again, rising stars, shining stars, be careful we don't burn them out and also not to create teacher's pet. So let's talk a little bit about conflict between employees. You have two employees who are not getting along, employee one and employee two. First off, there are six questions that I ask every employee in especially a new situation where I don't always know what's going on. I don't know the culture of the department or I don't know the culture of the team very well. And these six questions are, are, are pretty obvious, but they're your knowledge of them and your use of them can be very useful just to say, here's what's going on in this particular team. The six questions are, what do you like about your job? The obvious number two is, what don't you like about your job? And if employees are honest, they will tell you. The third question is, what do your coworkers do that makes your job easier or supports what you're trying to do? Excuse me. The fourth question is, what do your coworkers do that drives you crazy? What, what do you wish they wouldn't do? The fifth question is, what do, what, and this is the, it takes courage to ask this question, what do I do as your boss that you like, that's, that's supportive, that's useful for you? And the sixth question is obviously, what do I do as your boss? Or if I ask the question as an outside guy, right, coming into the organization, I'll say, what does your boss do that makes you crazy? So if I have truthfulness coming from the person, and, and, and that's based on confidentiality and rapport and, and kind of good alignment and feeling safe in that conversation, I will ask what they like or don't like about their jobs, like or don't like about their coworkers, like or don't like about their boss. I can get in those six questions quite a lot of information about the culture. When I think about the culture and those answers, and I have two employees who aren't getting along with each other, I will use those six questions with each to kind of figure out a kind of a barometer, a measure, a thermometer of the boiling points that they both have with each other. It could be something that's longstanding. It could be something that's just uh, an eccentricity they both have. It could be based on some harassing or bullying behavior. It could be based on that each feels that they are not working to their full capacity. When I have that, those two employees that aren't getting along, I start the first conversation with one separately to say, tell me these answers to these six questions. And also, when you look at the other person that you're in conflict with, what are you, what drives you the most crazy? And what are you most willing to do to make changes yourself? What are you most willing to be different around them? Then I send that person away, bring in the second employee. Same six questions. What are you in conflict with this other person I just talked to? And what are you willing to do? Or what would you like this person to do to make changes? And so the phrase that I want you to think about in the conflict resolution between employees, and sometimes we can do it when group the group is not functioning well as well, is ground rules. Ground rule says we agree as a group to treat each other this way. We agree as a group to honor our boss's wishes about this particular way that we do things. Between two employees that aren't getting along, these are the ground rules that my boss has created for me, and I will follow them. That's what we're hoping for. Uh, don't walk away when I'm talking to you. Return phone calls within 24 hours. You know, don't roll your eyes when I'm asking you things that sometimes employees do with each other that drives me crazy. So my focus on employee conflict resolution is the search for ground rules. What will you agree to do? What will you agree to do with this other person? What do you want them to do? If you can start the ground rules conversation, you can go back to employee one and start to introduce the what ground rules employee two might want from him or her. You can go back to employee two, second meeting, and say, here are the ground rules that employee one has thought about for you. Can you abide by these? Can you do some of these? The final meeting between two employees in terms of conflict resolution is sometimes the most difficult, which is to get them both in the same room, and you don't have to, and sometimes they don't want to, and you don't have to force it, but sometimes you can say, I will facilitate a conversation between you two. In that facilitated conversation, I will discuss the ground rules I thought I heard you both agree to. I will help specify and describe in better detail the ground rules I thought both of you agreed to. I will ask you as your supervisor to abide by these ground rules and to get along. The problem with the meeting sometimes is it, 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 if it's uncontrolled, it turns into a screaming match or people get angry or tearful or super, super um, frustrated. That's not useful. You can't allow it to de-evolve like that. And the other problem is sometimes the employees will complain to you your face and your eye contact about the behavior of the other person instead of talking to that person politely. 
And so what I say in those meetings is don't talk to me, talk to your colleague. I will be there to facilitate it, to make sure it's safe and nothing, nothing horrible happens in this meeting, but you must speak to each other like professional adults in a professional environment. So the coaching contract should be based, as we wrap up, and I'm ready to take questions from me if you have them, should be based on behaviors, not labels. You're always late to the label. Here's how you get to work at, at eight o'clock is a specific set of behaviors. Smart goals, right? Specific and measurable and attainable and relevant and timely or trackable, right? That we are deadline driven, that the coaching does not go on for years. It, we may have a one and done or a two or three and done or a four and done. Um, I typically feel like in my experience, if I can't get the changes I'm looking for for the employee, it's either on me because I'm not articulating myself correctly or it's on them because they don't want to change after four or five meetings. Um, it's results oriented. We look for positive changes in performance or behavior. We reward people when they do well for us on our behalf. The employee owns the solutions. We're not micromanaging them. We're not forcing them through, through unnecessary or punitive discipline. We're using discipline as the last coaching discussion where we shift from one concept to another uh, using the PAM. And the last one, recognizing shared fates and shared responsibilities. You want them to do well. They want to do well on your behalf and they want to do well on their own behalf personally. And that's what coaching contract is all about. So when I think about this last slide here, this coaching dynamic, I'm, I'm, this came from my dad, my father, Carl Albrecht, uh, a longtime management consultant, is, is this kind of movement here we see from the left to the right, where you're starting off in a teaching or a tutorial role. You're shifting into more of an advisory or a consulting role. And in the, at the end stage in coaching, the employee goes, I got it. I know what I'm supposed to do. I'm comfortable with the assignment. I'm comfortable with what I'm supposed to do. So you move from left to right through a series of one conversation or several conversations or a span of several weeks or even months, especially if it's a training issue or a compliance issue where they can be in compliance very quickly or should be in compliance, then you move through these steps pretty quickly. But if you look at tutorial or teaching advisory sort of supportive consulting role, third one, assisted discovery, the employee says, I know how to do this myself. That's success in the coaching discussion. So think about what we've talked about and your candidates and what you're looking at, this mentorship for career development and also for those, it's either a performance change that you're looking for or a behavioral change. And again, we can keep a coaching file for those conversations so that you know that you see success and it helps you write a more accurate performance evaluation. So Michelle, back over to you, happy to take any questions. Great, that was an awesome presentation, a lot of information. Um, many of you have asked about uh, whether or not the presentation is going to be available, and um, we will be sending a follow-up email with instructions on how to access that. We do have a few questions, Steve, and the first one is some asked if they said they would love to have some coaching tips when everybody's working remotely. Do you have any advice on that? Yeah, so the issue I think is is if the employee feels uncomfortable on Zoom, then maybe the telephone is better. Some employees have have a kind of anxieties about eye contact and things like that. That's fine. Then it maybe the telephone is better. Uh, I think that as long as people feel the coaching conversation through remote is confidential, that it's not necessarily being recorded or other people can can listen in. That's that's part of it as well. But I think you can coach electronically. Um, I think the meetings tend to be a little bit shorter because an hour is a long time to be on the phone. An hour is a long time to be in Zoom, except in this in environment we're training. Um, but I think the shorter meetings tends to be better. But I, I think it's certainly possible. And you say, what's the comfort zone for the employee? Let's match that. Great. Um, another question we had is, do you have any insight to share on coaching passive aggressive individuals? That's a, a common one. It's probably my least favorite. Um, passive aggressive people, if you've had them in your life personally and professionally, you go away from the, the conversation angry and you don't know why, why am I bugged? Why am, why am I upset? I'm the boss, why does this person make me upset? I think one of the things I do for passive aggressive people is I test for truth. Sometimes they will make sweeping generalizations that aren't true and they'll say things like we always or you never or, or you always and I'll say, well, you know, give me an example where that's been true. And sometimes they make sweeping generalizations to bypass their responsibility. I think also that you say, I can't let certain uh, passive aggressive people push my buttons because that's what they're good at and they've been doing it for a long time. So when I recognize those things, I don't take it personally. I say, I'm just gonna stick to the business issue. Great. Um, another question we had, somebody's looking for any advice on shining stars that slowly turn into problem children. 
Yeah, that's a, a tough one because there's sometimes an internal motivation that you didn't see. There's a there's an internal demotivator. There's something that happened. They missed an opportunity. They feel burnt out. Uh, they may be having health issues or off the job issues, which you don't need to delve into, you know, for privacy reasons. But sometimes you can say you were on this path in terms of success, and now you've kind of de-evolved. And why is that? Maybe it's me. I'm not. I've not recognized it fast enough. I've not. I'm not given the opportunities. I think if you can have a kind of you know, check-in conversation, kind of a temperature-taking conversation. You may be able to figure out that, you know, they, they missed an opportunity or they missed something that you you did not realize was significant to them. Uh, maybe a blind spot for you or something they just didn't reveal that, that could help kind of turn them around. But sometimes that that's over a long span of time. They go from, you know, really well-performing to not so much. And and maybe it's just, a, a you know, um, they're tired. They feel burnt out. There, there's some things that can be investigated there. Great. We have a few more questions, but since we've run out of time, we will address those. I will send the questions to Dr. Albrecht, and then we'll send you responses. But we do appreciate you for attending today's webinar presented by Heffernan. We will send information by email, as I mentioned, with instructions on how to access a copy of the presentation on our website. Thank you, Dr. Albrecht, for your time and expertise today. We hope all of you attendees found today's webinar to be a valuable use of your time. Thank you all, and have a safe day. Thanks a lot, everybody.